Today's video is sponsored by Bright Sellers and they want to do something glorious. They want to send you wine to drink. You don't even have to leave your house. What is better than that? Not very much. Look, if you're like me, you probably like discovering new wines to drink and enjoy and that's actually something the Bright Sellers is particularly good at. They scour the globe looking for hidden gems across many of the small vineyards that line the Italian countryside or the South American islands. And Bright Sellers maximizes the chances that you're going to love the wine they send you by providing you with a super short quiz about what you like. There's no snobbery, it's all very accessible, and they show you a lot of wines from around the world that you're most likely to enjoy based on your responses. Clever, eh? There's no questions about tannins or mouthfeels or other uptown gibberish. It's more like, what's your favorite type of chocolate? Or what juice do you like? That sort of thing. So after you take that quiz, Bright Sellers send you some wine and they guarantee that you'll like it. If you don't, they'll send you another bottle with your next delivery. You can also choose how much they send and each box is recyclable with a low footprint and it's also got wine education cards so you can learn about what you're drinking. Excellent. Right now, you guys can get 60% off your first four bottle box plus a bonus bottle thrown in on top. And as an additional promotion, the first 50 customers to head to brightsellers.com forward slash brainfood60 will also receive a free corkscrew with their purchase. So that's 60% off four bottles plus a bonus bottle plus a free corkscrew for the first 50 customers. That's a deal. Brightsellers.com forward slash brainfood60. Let's go. It's a classic action movie scenario. At the climax of the story, our hero must infiltrate the villain's lair, which is guarded by a small army of gun-wielding henchmen. But despite being gifted with the obligatory perfect aim and bottomless magazines, for one reason or another, our hero can't simply charge in guns blazing. Perhaps this is a stealth mission and gunfire would attract too much attention, or perhaps like MacGyver or Batman, our hero has an aversion to guns or tries to avoid killing as much as possible. Whatever the case, thankfully, they have plenty of options for simply knocking out the henchmen. They could shoot them with a tranquilizer dart or come in close to administer chloroform or knock out gas. Or if all else fails, there's always the good old-fashioned knockout blow to the head. Equally fortunate for our hero, the villain also doesn't like to kill, at least not right away. He would rather capture our hero alive and subject them to a more elaborate and exotic death involving giant lasers or a tank full of sharks or something and so in the course of the battle our hero is struck over the head and knocked unconscious only to come to a few hours later a bit dazed but otherwise fully alert and ready to make their daring escape and finally defeat the villain only no no they wouldn't at least not in real life. More likely they would wake up with an incapacitating headache, a severe concussion, or just not wake up at all. For sadly, for all you would-be action heroes out there, rendering someone unconscious is a far more complicated and dangerous business than Hollywood would have you believe. Starting with the classic knockout blow to the head, while athletes like boxers are knocked unconscious all the time, the mechanics and effects of such knockouts are very different from what is typically portrayed in movies. Firstly, most boxing knockouts are inflicted not by a single massive punch, but by a series of punches whose cumulative effect ultimately results in unconsciousness. The moment of unconsciousness is usually preceded by a progressive loss of motor coordination starting in the feet, as Anthony Alessi, a ringside physician for the Connecticut State Boxing Commission, explains. They become flat-footed, which is the inability to adjust. Boxers can't move forward or backward quickly. As you watch their feet, you realize that the same lack of coordination is going on in their upper extremities extremities in their hands, and eventually they are unable to defend themselves. Secondly, in most movies, people are rendered unconscious by a blow to the back or top of the head, often with a beer bottle, vase, or some other breakable object. In reality, such blows rarely result in unconsciousness, for the key to a successful knockout is imparting sufficient acceleration to the head. This acceleration is in turn transferred to the brain, which collides with the inside of the skull, inflicting trauma that results in a knockout. The ideal means of imparting such acceleration is to strike at the chin, causing the head and the brain to snap back violently. Even more effective is a blow to the side of the head, which imparts rotational acceleration to the brain. While in the former case, to 
the chin, the brain is somewhat protected by the cerebrospinal fluid in which it is suspended. This fluid offers no protection against rotation, meaning that it takes less force to knock someone out with a roundhouse punch than with an uppercut. The exact mechanism by which a knockout blow induces unconsciousness is still poorly understood, but one leading theory posits that trauma to the brain causes microscopic pores to form in the cell membranes of neurons, a process known as mechanoporation. These pores allow potassium ions to leak out of the neurons and calcium ions to flow in, depolarizing the cell. Restoring this electrolyte balance requires massive amounts of blood and energy, and when demand exceeds supply, the brain momentarily shuts itself down in order to conserve energy. And the key word here is momentarily. Unlike in the movies where a knocked out person remains unconscious for hours, allowing the henchmen to bundle the hero into a waiting car trunk and spirit them away to the villain's lair, real life knockouts typically last no longer than a few minutes. If unconsciousness persists for longer than that, this is typically a sign that something has gone really, really wrong. The person may be suffering from severe concussion or cerebral hemorrhaging, both of which can result in severe long-term health effects, including coma, permanent brain damage, or even death. Death is certainly a long-term health effect. In fact, I would say it's probably permanent. Indeed, studies have shown that around 90% of professional boxers will endure some form of brain injury over the course of their careers, while 15 to 40 will suffer permanent chronic brain damage. Thus, if our hero remains unconscious for hours on end, it's unlikely they will awake to find themselves fit and ready to fight. A somewhat safer method of rendering someone unconscious is to go for the jugular, or more accurately, the carotid artery. This can be done in a number of ways including the classic sleeper hold. The maneuver applies pressure to the carotid arteries, cutting off the blood flow to the brain and resulting in unconsciousness within 10 to 20 seconds. An even more dramatic technique is the carotid strike or Okinawan slap, taught in several martial arts, including karate and taekwondo. This consists of a sharp blow to the carotid sinus, the junction at the back of the neck where the common carotid artery branches into the internal and external carotid. This area contains numerous baroreceptor nerves, which which serve to detect and regulate changes in blood pressure. The carotid strike fools these receptors into thinking that the victim's blood pressure is too high, triggering a massive drop in pressure that temporarily starves the brain of oxygen, leading to immediate unconsciousness. But while certainly dramatic enough for the silver screen, as with the knockout blow, the effects of the sleeper hold or carotid strike are short-lived, with unconsciousness lasting only a few minutes at most. These techniques also come with their own severe health risks, including accidental strangulation dislodging blood clots, and the accidental stimulation of the glossopharyngeal nerve resulting in cardiac arrest. Alright, so physically knocking someone out is too risky for our morally upright hero or gloating assessed villain. But what about a chemical knockout, like the knockout gas so widely favoured by the villains of the 1960s Batman TV series? Alas, despite what Hollywood would have us believe, pharmacologically induced unconsciousness in many ways is even more fraught with risk than the good old-fashioned knockout blow. A classic knockout method of the detective genre is to soak a rag in ether or chloroform and to hold it over the victim's mouth and nose. This apparently results in near-instant unconsciousness that lasts for hours, allowing our dastardly villain's henchmen to easily spirit away the unsuspecting damsel in distress. But while ether and chloroform can induce unconsciousness and were used for over a hundred years as surgical anesthetics, the real-life effects of these chemicals are nowhere near as quick or as tidy as their fictional counterparts. Dyer Ethyl ether was first prepared in 1540 by Prussian botanist Valerius Cordus, who immediately noted that inhaling its vapors produced a powerful feeling of euphoria and unconsciousness at higher doses. Over the next 300 years, the chemical was widely used as a recreational drug, drunk mainly by the lower classes as a substitute for alcohol. Starting in the late 18th century and 19th centuries, it also became popular among upper-class students who consumed it at raucous ether frolics, along with another recently discovered euphoric substance, nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas. It was at one such party in 1844 that American dentist Horace Wells observed a curious phenomenon. While intoxicated on nitrous oxide, one attendee struck his leg on a wooden bench but appeared to feel no pain. Realizing that nitrous oxide might hold the key to eliminating the pain of tooth extraction and other surgical procedures, Wells embarked upon a series of experiments culminating in a public demonstration at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston on January 20, 1845. Unfortunately for Wells, the gas was improperly administered, and when he attempted to extract a tooth from his patient, they cried out in pain, causing the audience of medical students to 
storm out shouting humbug. While Wells's career never recovered from this incident, one attendee, a fellow dentist named William Morton, was inspired by the demonstration and set off in search of better anesthetic gas. He settled on diethyl ether after accidentally leaving a bottle open in his study and being knocked unconscious by the fumes. Further experimentation revealed just how useful and versatile ether was as an anesthetic. Being a liquid, it was more readily transportable and could easily be administered by placing a cloth or a gauze-lined mask over the patient's nose and dripping the ether onto it. Even better, the effective dose of ether was relatively low, meaning that the patient lost consciousness before dangerous levels could accumulate in the blood and did not risk being asphyxiated as with inhaling nitrous oxide. On October 16, 1846, Morton conducted a historic demonstration at Massachusetts General Hospital in an amphitheater now known as the Ether Dome. Once the patient, Mr. Gilbert Abbott, but was sedated with ether, surgeon Dr. John Warren proceeded to remove a tumor from his neck. Though ether had first been used as a general anesthetic four years earlier by Georgia physician Dr. Crawford Long, Morton's demonstration brought the practice into the mainstream, and for nearly a hundred years, diethyl ether would remain the surgical anesthetic of choice until the introduction of more modern inhalants like halothene in the 1950s. But ether was not without its drawbacks. For one thing, it was highly volatile and flammable, resulting in numerous explosive operating room accidents. It also produced a number of unpleasant side effects, such as irritation of the mucous membranes, profuse salivation, and violent post-operative nausea. Thus, in 1847, Scottish physician Sir James Young Simpson began experimenting with an alternative anesthetic, Chloroform. A clear, sweet-smelling liquid, chloroform was non-flammable and induced unconsciousness more quickly for longer periods and at lower doses than ether. After being famously administered to Queen Victoria in 1853 during the birth of her eighth child, Prince Leopold, use of chloroform in medicine exploded, the drug remaining in common use until the 1930s. Yet despite the proven track record of ether and chloroform as surgical anesthetics, they are hardly the tools of choice for a would-be kidnapper. For one thing, the effects of these substances are far from instantaneous. Indeed, it can take up to 20-30 minutes of deep breathing of chloroform or ether fumes for unconsciousness to set in, a procedure requiring a tad more cooperation than the average kidnap victim is likely to display. At high doses, ether can also irritate the lungs and throat, leading to violent coughing and spasms that make further inhalation and absorption difficult. Even worse, while ether is relatively safe even at high doses, the therapeutic index of chloroform, that is, the difference between an effective dose and an overdose is very narrow, creating a high risk of accidental overdose. As chloroform is a respiratory and cardiac depressant, such an overdose can lead to a cessation of breathing, cardiac arrest, and ultimately death. Furthermore, the dosage required to induce unconsciousness or an overdose varies widely from person to person, being affected by factors as diverse as age, sex, body mass, and overall fitness. Indeed, the difficulty of administering the correct dose to safely induce unconsciousness is precisely why the specialized field of anesthesiology exists in the first place. A dramatic demonstration of the effects of improper dosage took place on October the 23rd, 2002, when 40 Chechen terrorists took over the Dubrovka Theater in Moscow and held 850 patrons hostage. During the ensuing siege, Russian Spetsnaz special forces troops pumped an anesthetic gas into the theater's ventilation system to incapacitate the terrorists prior to storming the building. But while the raid succeeded in killing all 40 terrorists, the gas dosage proved too high, resulting in the deaths of 115 of the 100. 117 hostages killed in the siege, and a further 400 hostages being hospitalized. While the Russian government has never officially revealed the identity of the gas used, experts speculate that it might have been an aerosolized hallucinogen known as BZ or QNB, a derivative of the powerful opiate fentanyl such as carapentanol. But whatever the case, the tragedy of the Moscow theater siege clearly demonstrates that while gauging the correct dose of an anesthetic in a controlled medical environment is difficult, in an uncontrolled environment, it's nearly impossible. The problem of dosage also applies to that other favorite knockout delivery system, the tranquilizer dart. When used on animals, the dosage of tranquilizer darts must be carefully matched to the target's body mass and metabolism in order to a ensure that the dart actually knocks the animal out, and b to prevent an overdose. Most common tranquilizing darts, like sodium thiopental and azepirone, are powerful respiratory depressants, meaning that upon being tranquilized, animals must be closely monitored by veterinarians to ensure that they don't suddenly stop breathing. As our intrepid hero is likely to encounter henchmen of all shapes and sizes, using 
Adopting a one-size-fits-all tranquilizer diet is likely to result in either a whole lot of groggy but still conscious henchmen or a whole lot of dead ones. Furthermore, as with inhaled anesthetics, the effects of injected tranquilizers are not instantaneous. Even the most powerful drugs require a few minutes to circulate through the bloodstream and take effect. More than enough time for a henchman to return a fire or at least sound the alarm. And this is assuming a best-case scenario wherein the drug is injected directly into the bloodstream. A random tranquilizer dart hit is more likely to result in an intramuscular injection, which will take even longer to take effect. But what about slipping something into someone's drink, the signature move of many fictional femme fatales? This practice is popularly known as slipping a Mickey Finn after one Michael Mickey Finn, the infamous 19th century proprietor of Chicago's Lone Star Saloon who was alleged to have drugged his patron's drinks before robbing them. Finn's drug of choice, and that of many a spy and detective fiction writer thereafter, was chloral hydrate, a sedative and hypnotic once widely used in psychiatric hospitals due to its low cost and is still occasionally used today for sedating children and treating insomnia. But once again, as with injected or inhaled sedatives, the effects of chloral hydrate are nowhere near as instantaneous as depicted in the movies. Depending on dosage, it can take anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes for unconsciousness to set in. And like chloroform, the therapeutic index of chloral hydrate is extremely narrow, with overdose occurring at doses as low as 600 milligrams. Lower doses can induce a variety of unpleasant side effects including nausea, vomiting, confusion, convulsions, irregular breathing, and cardiac arrhythmia, while higher doses can lead to coma, respiratory arrest, and death. Not necessarily an issue if you're trying to rob saloon patrons, but something of a problem if you're trying to safely knock out and kidnap someone. In conclusion, despite Hollywood's frequent assertions to the contrary, a quick, reliable, and safe way to render someone unconscious for long periods of time is a lot harder to achieve than they depict. The brain is a surprisingly resilient organ and any injury or chemical capable of shutting it down even temporarily is likely to inflict further more serious damage. Thus, as we've likely shouted dozens of times at overly righteous heroes or monologuing villains, sometimes it's just easier to shoot the bloody bastard. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.